Hey, we're going to get started. Uh, I'm Greg Lyman. My grandfather was Lynn Lyman. Uh, Desert News, before he died, did a full page uh, article on him, calling him Mr. Hole in the Rock. He led 50 expeditions in Jeeps, well, originally on horses, donkeys, whatever, mules to the Hole in the Rock. Um, I just wanted to, I, I invited uh, Lamont to speak to some youth at a youth conference at uh, Utah State uh, years ago, and he uh, electrified these kids, so you're in for a treat. I was going to tell Lamont that um, I found all of my grandfather's slides, so come over and we'll go through them and you'll find some images of the Hole in the Rock that have never before been seen in decades. Um, so I give you, he's an electrical engineer, a former bishop, he has 18 grandchildren, four, four or five children. Uh, he has done more uh, for the cause of educating the public about the Hole in the Rock and honoring those pioneers than anyone I know, so I give you the Monk Crabtree. Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me? Uh, I can't see you, so I assume you can hear me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. I, uh, I'm going to, a lot of this is review for many of you, uh, but I'm going to walk through some of the challenges they faced on the journey, uh, and in particular the challenges that Platt D. Lyman faced uh, as he was called upon to become the primary leader of the journey uh, at a very young age of 32. Here there were members of the journey twice his age. Uh, and uh, what a remarkable experience this must have been for him. Uh, just to put things in perspective, I know all of you are familiar with the Hole in the Rock and it's a bit intimidating to talk about the Hole in the Rock to the Lymans. Uh, you know, I usually ask if there are any descendants or anyone in the audience that have connections to the Hole in the Rock journey. Uh, and I'm always at ease if there aren't any, because then it doesn't matter what I say, nobody knows any better. Uh, but I know that's not the case today. Uh, but, but to help put this in, journey in perspective, I, I don't know that we fully appreciate the difficulty of the journey. Uh, the, uh, now, I don't want to compare this to things like the Willie Hancar Company because from a standpoint of the loss of life, they did not experience anything like that. But from a standpoint of the difficulty of the journey, the length of the journey, uh, it took them three times longer to go from uh, Parowan to Bluff than it took the Willie Hancar Company to go the 1,300 miles to Salt Lake. Uh, the Willie Hancar Company made an average of 15 miles per day, even with all their difficulties. Uh, the Hole in the Rock, their total average was 1.6 miles per day. Uh, I have a friend, an acquaintance, he's since passed away, by the name of Montel Seeley, and some of you have probably seen the Castle Del Pageant. He wrote that pageant, and he was a man who was very comfortable in a wagon, covered wagon, or pulling a handcart. And uh, he called me one day. Uh, he told me that he was a descendant of Hole in the Rock pioneers. And it was right after the sesquicentennial celebrations of the pioneers coming to the Salt Lake Valley. And during that celebration, he had built a handcart, and he had pulled his little handcart uh, the 1,300 miles to Salt Lake during this celebration. And he was in his 70s at the time. And uh, he, he called me after this experience and said, Lamont, I would like to take my handcart from Escalante to Bluff, and I want to live off the land. I want to know where all the springs are. So I met with him and gave him maps and told him about the springs I was aware of. And uh, when he 
got the bluff a couple of weeks after the, he began, he called me again and he said, Lamont, pulling a handcart the 1,300 miles from winter quarters uh, to Salt Lake was a walk in the park. Now I have had a real pioneering experience. Uh, now with respect to Platt D. Lyman, uh, <clears throat> Platt D. Lyman, as you study his life, uh, find him to be a very remarkable uh, man. Uh, he married uh, Adelia, Adelia Robinson at the age of 19 and within days left for his first European mission. Then I believe he was 27 years old when he was called again to England on another mission. And when he returned at the age of 29, he was called as the Bishop of Oak City. And then just a few years later, he was called to help preside over the San Juan mission and the journey to Bluff. <clears throat> Now, as you know, by the mid-1870s, one of the only major sections in the state of, or in the territory of what would become the state of Utah was the southeastern section. There had been attempts to colonize the area with the Elk Mountain Mission as early as 1856, but they had failed. Uh, the, when the church initiated the plan to establish a settlement somewhere in that area, uh, the people who were to provide the missionaries were from the western portions of the state. Uh, Erastus Snow, the general authority assigned to the project, uh, sent a letter to the participants, and he outlined the primary objectives. And these are his statements. Settle the unoccupied territories that the saints might have a place to dwell. And there's some real significance in that. There had been some tremendous success in the southern states just prior to this. And prior to Brigham Young's death, he proposed that rather than the converts coming to Salt Lake and then being dispersed to various locations in the territory, if they were already from a southern climate, that they were to go directly to a southern climate and not come clear up to Salt Lake. And uh, there was some great successes uh, in the southern missions a couple of years prior to the Hole in the Rock. So much so that uh, over a hundred converts headed for the Four Corners area, but there was no settlement there yet. Uh, they planned to go on down into the little Colorado area of Arizona, but the saints there sent reports that there wasn't enough water there to support, support them. So they didn't know where to go. They didn't dare continue into Utah. So they negotiated a deal with the governor of Colorado and ended up occupying or establishing Manassa, Colorado. So there was a need. In fact, Silas S. Smith was assigned to preside over those saints as well as Platt D. Lyman. So there, there was a real urgent need to establish a settlement somewhere within the territory that could accommodate these people. <laughs> the other objective that Jurassic Snow defined was to establish a missionary labor amongst the Utes and the Navajos. In, uh, the, in December of 1878, the first calls were issued during state conferences and the first ones were issued in the Parowan Meeting House. Uh, I don't know that we can fully appreciate the challenge of going to a state conference 
and learning that you've been asked to participate in a colonization endeavor. Uh, to go, uh, to sell what you have, to go to some unknown region. You know, when I think of moving, I, I think of buying a new house in an established portion of the country. When they moved to a new unoccupied territory, there was nothing. Uh, their livelihood, their lives depended on getting crops in immediately and being successful with those crops or all would be lost. So I just can't imagine the difficult challenge of accepting a call like that. Uh, one sister, uh, Jody Woods, uh, as you know, she became the midwife in Bluff. Uh, she had a feeling that she was, her family was going to be called, so she stayed home from conference. And she was called, and eventually they did go. Silas S. Smith, cousin to the prophet Joseph Smith, was called to preside over the journey, and shortly after arriving, he was called as the stake president for the people in Bluff, the surrounding communities, as well as these people in Colorado. <clears throat> the big question was where to settle specifically and how to get there. Silas S. Smith, in April of 1879, uh, led an exploring expedition that crossed the Colorado River at Lee's Ferry, the only established crossing at that time, and then cut through the Navajo Nation. As soon as they were out of the Navajo Territory, they looked for a possible place for a settlement. They established land claims along the San Juan River, and then they followed the old Spanish Trail clear up towards Castledale through what's called Salina Pass and back to Cedar City. That journey was well over a thousand miles. It took five months. Now, it's interesting, there's lots of speculation as to why they didn't take the southern route. Two years prior to that exploration, the mission president then in Moenkopi, Arizona, amongst the Indians, there was asked to go meet with the heads of the Navajo Nation to see how they felt about a Mormon community coming in their area. And so James Brown met with what was one of the primary uh, clansmen. There wasn't just one chief over the entire Navajo Nation. And his name was Bastine. And he said to uh, President Brown, just wait a few minutes here on my property. I'm going to send messengers out and invite the other main clansmen to come. So within a few days, he had 13 other main clansmen of the Navajo Nation, as well as 200 other participants come to this meeting. And uh, Chief Bastine presented what it was that James Brown was asking, which was, how do you feel about a Mormon community coming amongst your people? Uh, and they powwowed together, and they, their conclusion, and what they told President Brown was, you're welcome to come as neighbors but we do not have enough water. You cannot use our springs. That right there completely eliminated the southern route for the main mission. The explorers went that route. They just had a small group. They had to negotiate and pay for the use of some springs, and in some cases they had to make new ones. And in a few spots they almost lost their lives. So taking the southern route was absolutely out of the question 
It was totally against what the Navajo leaders, the Navajo leaders' wishes. Now, while Silas S. Smith is doing all of this exploring, uh, Platt D. Lyman goes to General Conference in April of 1879. And he talks to the leaders of the church, and he said, we're having a very difficult time in Oak City. There's just not enough water to support the people there. How would you feel about me being released as the bishop and going elsewhere with my family. And uh, while he was there, Arast Snow heard about this, met with him and asked him, how would he feel about taking his family over to the Colorado River? Now they hadn't decided for sure on the San Juan River yet, the explorers weren't back, but it was gonna be somewhere in that area. And Platt D. Lyman said, I will be glad to go wherever the church would like me to go, provided I get an honorable release as bishop. Otherwise, I will stay right here in Oak City. Well, they gave him an honorable release. And then in August, 1879, he gets a letter calling him to be Silas S. Smith's assistant to head the group of people to the San Juan River there in the Four Corners area. Platt D. Lyman was ac uh, accompanied by several of his extended family members and brothers and sisters and, and in one case uh, a, a sister-in-law. Now calls seldom come at a convenient time that certainly was the case for Platt de Lyman. Uh, a few months prior to this call being received, and now the call is received towards the end of August, uh, Silas S. Smith isn't even back from that exploring expedition yet. Uh, and they're preparing to leave to go on this mission the San Juan area and they're looking at leaving as soon as they can sometime in the fall. Uh, Silas S. Smith, excuse me, Platt D. Lyman's sister earlier that spring uh, died a few days or about a week after giving birth to her first child, uh, Joseph Callister. And uh, Platt D. Lyman and his dear wife took that child in and his dear wife took care of that baby and they raised that child because the father died, I think it was in December of that same year. Now, if you've ever gone to the Bluff Fort, there's a large monument of all of the names of the Hole in the Rock participants. This baby, we realized, uh, Joseph Callister that was raised by the Lymans uh, and taken to Bluff and he grew up in that area. We left him off that plaque. Uh, uh, and uh, so we, we realized the mistake and his name has now been added to the plaque because we were not just including those who went through the initial hole in the rock because Platt D. Lyman's wife did not initially come with him. They, came about a year later. But uh, we rectified that and he's now on the plaque. So, uh, Adelia Platt D. Lyman's wife is caring for this baby. And three weeks prior to his departure, their one and a half year old daughter dies. And that was their third child to die within three years. And Adelia is expecting uh, Albert R. Lyman at the time. She's five or six months along. Uh, and so in accepting this call, it means Platt D. Lyman is likely not even going to be around when she delivers. So you can understand why she stayed home 
and also three or four weeks prior to his departure, Platy Lyman accepts the principle of plural marriage at the time and uh, marries Annie Clark. She also remained there behind, I'm guessing, to help Adelia. After Platt D. Lyman gets back, they gather everyone in a state conference, and uh, Smith, these are notes from that state conference, it says that Silas S. Smith persuaded the people not to go via the Navajo Nation. He understood the issues there, and the original intent must have been to go that way, because there was already a ferry. Uh, so he convinces them we can't go that way. And he announces that the decision is made to go via Salina Pass. Uh, so that's their plan. They're going to take the Salina Path route, clear up through the old Spanish Trail. Now, the old Spanish Trail was not a wagon road at the time. Uh, the first people who took that route into Moab had to lower their wagons over a cliff that you can still see just east of the entrance of Arches National Park. So it was no easy route, and they would need a ferry on the Colorado River at what is now Moab. They would also need a ferry on the Green River. Uh, <clears throat> now something must have happened at this state conference, and I'm guessing that's when the Escalante people met with Silas S. Smith and said, and we know, we're not sure who all said it, but we know at least Charles Hall was part of it, who lived in Escalante. He had discovered that there was a location on the Colorado River where there were no rapids, that though very difficult to get to, you could get to it. Uh, and it was about 60 miles east of Escalante. Uh, the problem was there was no time for any additional explorations. Many of the people had already sold homes and farms. They needed to be off immediately. Uh, but based on that, they made the decision to take the Escalante route, even though it had only been explored up to the Colorado River. Uh, this appeared in the, in the newspaper uh, on October 15th. For those going to San Juan, the intention of the company to take the route through Salina Pass has changed. The reason it's a scarcity of any feed along the way, and the new road across the Colorado was shortened the distance some 200 miles. Silas S. Smith went on to say, the direct route will be a great benefit, not only to the San Juan people, but also to the people in Arizona and New Mexico. So that's the background of the decision. And on October 26, they began their journey. Some people have speculated or have been critical, why so late? Well, that was normal. These were farmers. They traveled during the winter to get to a destination in time to plant their spring crops. Uh, plus, you wouldn't want to travel in the heat with your teams down in that area. Their first major task was to go over the Escalante Mountains. There was already a little bit of snow on the top of them, and that was the only possible way you could get to Escalante at the time. From Escalante, which was the last major settlement along the route, and I'm guessing that may have also contributed to the decision. Escalante was in their back door with respect to where they're going. There are some resources there. There's people there. There are some people who can build a ferry. There are log timbers up in the mountains. Had they gone the other route, they would have had a tremendous distance to go, you know, four or five hundred miles to get to Moab area, the Moab area, and then they still got to build a ferry. Uh, so there were some other advantages of this route, primarily the town of Escalante and the resources to build a ferry, and Charles Hall knew how to do that. 
The Escalante Desert was flanked on one side by the Colorado River, excuse me, the Escalante River, and on the other side by the Kaparowitz Plateau. And they headed out in the Escalante De Desert toward what became Forty Mile Spring. And their route was initially quite easy and easily traversed. Uh, the specific route was chosen based on watering holes, such as Ten Mile Spring, Twenty Mile Spring, Coyote Hose, and then Forty Mile Spring. <clears throat> this is Forty Mile Spring. Forty Mile Spring soon, uh, soon grew to a population of 250 men, women, and children, and over 85 wagons. And this is where Dance Hall Rock is located. Uh, and they did enjoy themselves, even though they had a difficult journey. Now, Flat D. Lyman was assigned, when they got the dance hall rock, they asked Platt D. Lyman to take 13 men, including my great-grandfather, uh, with him to the Colorado River to cross it and explore, for the first time, the terrain on the east side. Uh, these 13 men across the Colorado River uh, used a wagon box to make a makeshift boat. Uh, and they encountered for the first time what became known of as the hole or the hole in the rock, a natural crevice. Uh, the natural, this crevice had a sheer drop-off, initial, initial drop-off, uh, so they found a different way to get down to the river called Jackass Bench. Now they crossed the Colorado, excuse me, they first went down the Colorado River to see if they could get down to the San Juan and go up it. They couldn't do that. They went up what's called Cottonwood Canyon, which is right across from the hole, and they made it and then they went all the way down to the San Juan River again, and they went as far as what they believe is the area called the Chute. Flat uh, D. Lyman and these other 12 men came back, reported to Silas S. S. Smith what they had discovered, and they were quite discouraged. Flat D. Lyman didn't feel it was possible to continue on or that there would be any use in taking this route. and. Uh, the clerk, Charles Walton, recorded that uh, the summary of the scouts was that the terrain was so difficult it was not fit for a bird to fly over it. I think that's the best description of it I have ever come across. Uh, now they faced a tremendous dilemma. What did they do? It's too late to choose another route. It has taken six weeks just to reach 40 Mile Spring. Many of them have already sold their farms and homes. Uh, if they go back, everybody would certainly understand and relatives would accommodate them, but it would be the end of the mission with this group of people anyway. Uh, they faced three major problems. First. The Escalante Mountain, the snow was starting to come onto the higher elevations of the Escalante Mountain. Now, some people speculate that they had no choice but to go on because the return was blocked. The return wasn't blocked, meant Silas S. Smith went back. The issue with the Escalante Mountain was if it became totally blocked, they wouldn't be able to get the blasting powder over. They had to have blasting powder if they were going to continue. So one issue is the Escalante Mountain. If it becomes totally blocked, they're in big trouble because they've got to get supplies over it. Another issue is the, San, it's the Colorado River. Uh, they put a lot of faith in Charles Hall. Could he really make a ferry? Could they get wagons on the ferry and from one side of the river, 350 foot wide river, to the other side and hit the landing before it went downstream too far and all would be lost. So the ferry had to work. 
and then the rest of the unexplored territory that they had no idea what was out there. So they sent out explorers. From, well, before they did that, of course, they had a meeting. And uh, <clears throat> in this meeting, they discussed all of their options. Now, when they called for a sustaining vote, it was very different back then than it is today. Now, when a leader in your area or a church leader asks for a sustaining vote, they've already prayerfully made a decision and they're presenting the decision of your presiding officers and you're voting to sustain them or the person being called to a call. Back then it was a literal vote and anyone could propose an alternative. Uh, even state presidents were that way. If somebody, when they proposed that a new state president was called, anyone could propose another name. And whoever got the most votes was the new state president. And it was, and there were times when the standing state president would lose the vote, and it was called lost the vote. So, so it was very different back then, and we have no record of anyone not voting to move on. Uh, they all wanted to go on and complete their mission. So even though they had those three major obstacles to overcome, they voted to go on. <clears throat> and that's where Jens Nielsen made that famous statement, if we have plenty of sticky to duty, we cannot fail. Now I'm gonna speed way up, get you the Colorado River in the next five minutes or so. Uh, this just gives you a glimpse of what I think is some of the difficulties of the journey. And there are certainly some unsung heroes, particularly the women. You know, they had to take care of their children in extremely difficult situations while the men were out having a ball blasting, um, blowing up rocks, you know. And the center is the color, is the hole in the rock. The hole in the rock had some huge challenges. That 40 foot drop at the, at the top. Uh, two sections in the middle of it that were too narrow for wagons. And the bottom was too steep to control the wagons. In the meantime, they send out scouts to explore all the way. And uh, if the scouts were anticipated to be out for 15 days. It took them 15 days to get just a little over halfway, and they were lost on Christmas Eve without any food. They used up their last flour to make a flapjack and shared it. Uh, and they were desperately looking for a landmark. They, the next morning they climbed the knoll to the side there, the Salvation Knoll, and from there they, they could uh, see the, dis, the Elk Mountains, the Blue Mountains, which gave them an orientation for their destination. They eventually got back, decided that there was a possible way through that was gonna be very difficult. In the meantime, they're working on the crevice through the hole in the rock. There are sections in the hole in the rock where they had to raise the natural bottom by eight feet because the walls were too narrow to allow passage of the wagon. Uh, that entire section of wall there in the center of the screen, those are pick marks where they're widening that section. And the bottom is too steep to control their wagons, so they literally attack the road on the side of the cliff by widening a natural ledge, drilling in holes, and literally attacking the road on the side of the cliff called Uncle Ben's Dugway. The top of the hole in the rock was blasted out. There's one of the blast holes that's still seen, and that's the section they blasted out. Just a glimpse of what must have been a very challenging endeavor to blast that crevice or that road through the crevice which took six weeks on january 26 1880 they began their descent and you've all heard the story the first team brought forth and they apparently gave the honor to benjamin perkins uh, because he was the engineer in the hole in the rock and he passed the honor to i believe his brother however if you if you read Miller's book, I think there's at least six men that take credit for driving the first wagon down. 
So we're not quite sure uh, who drove the first wagon down, but the first team would not go. They could see down that crevice and they would not budge. But fortunately, somebody had two blind horses and the blind horses didn't know any better. And after they went down, the other teams could pick up the scent of the first one and give them some courage. Uh, illustration of the man hanging behind the wagons to help slow it down during the initial descent. And those are our children now all grown up. Now Charles Hall was one who built the ferry. Uh, when they, the ferry was large enough to accommodate two wagons. Uh, as when they launched the ferry, it would be the currents would take it downstream. They tied teams on it, pull it back up, so that it would land back at their original starting point. The ferry worked. This is one that matches the description, though this is not a photo of it but it does match the description of uh, what Charles Hall built with the help of almost every man in Escalante. Now, the work really begins. This is Cottonwood Canyon. Cottonwood Canyon is a box canyon. They've got to come up with what's called Cottonwood Hill. And uh, the Cottonwood Hill is divided into the dugway, the little hole in the rock, and then they've reached that kind of territory. They've just now reached the area that Platt D. Lyman considered is impassable. <clears throat> they continue through this, that's the chute. They work over Great Mesa. Olivia Larson goes into labor on Great Mesa and gives birth to a healthy boy. That's the second baby born in route. And coming down Gray Mesa, they've got to work blast switchbacks down the slick rock, called slick rocks, solid sandstone. You can see all the blasting work there. Then they cross Death Valley, uh, Lake Pagarit, now washed away, but they crossed on the dam at the time. Uh, Castle Wash, then they've got a 1,300 foot drop down Clay Hill Pass. Then they've got to work their way around Grand Gulch, which requires them to move to a higher elevation into uh, junipers and cedars. They cut down, chop down trees for 20 miles. You can still see some of those uh, tree stumps out there. Uh, now they're on what's called Cedar Mesa. The Cedar Mesa has no easy way down. It's these kind of canyons all the way around it. They find that following the old Anasazi Trail, they work their way down what's called the Twist. Uh, then they've got Comb Ridge, their last major barrier. To get up Comb Ridge, they build the road up San Juan Hill. Uh, by now, their teams are completely worn out. That's an actual axle and wagon wheel that's still out on the trail. Uh, seven span of horses. That's 14 horses or oxen to pull one wagon. Nobody had that many, so those poor animals would have to make multiple trips. Jens Nilsson, one of his teams, died going up San Juan Hill. That's where, if you recall, Rocks were covered with blood from the four legs of the struggling teams. Then on April 4, 1880, they arrive in the Bluff Valley. Uh, they designated April 6th as the formal arrival date to coincide with the celebrations of the restoration uh, of the organization of the church. Uh, now, <clears throat> Jens Nelson's daughter was not impressed. This is the worst place I have ever seen. Is this where we're going to stay? And he said, "Why, yes, where did you want to go? Now, Sarah Williams was not a member of the church when she went on this. She was, she came along to help care for her sister's children. 
She said the following, I didn't see anything to stop for, nor could I see it possible to make a town in such a place. How thankful I was that I did not have to make my home there. But she was also impressed with the people. The unity among the people coming out with no conveniences. And yet they were just as happy as they could be. It was on the trip out to Bluff that my eyes began to be open. To things, uh, the things began to come a little at a time. The singing had as much to do with it as any one thing, and the preaching of Platt Lyman. Now, Platt D. Lyman apparently took uh, from his father, because it's, I've read that Platt D. Lyman eventually became known as, as the most eloquent speaker in the church at the time. Sarah Williams joined the church, was baptized to the San Juan River, and then they headed home, left Bluff. It wasn't long before she was back in Bluff, became the plural wife of Sarah, of uh, Benjamin Perkins. And uh, Sarah Williams is in this photograph. Uh, with her 10 children, her sons on the, in the background on the porch, her first daughter, uh, Mary Ellen, is who Albert R. Lyman married. Now, they were successful in establishing a road that they could use for bi-directional travel for one full year and then they bypassed the hole in the rock with Hall's Crossing and continued to use that until 1884 when massive floods washed all ferries down the river. The hole in the rock route, a mistake or an advantage? Uh, if you look at the results versus the difficulty of the journey, I think it's very clear that it was a great success. We shouldn't judge one's success based on how difficult it was to become successful. We judge it on the results. There were no deaths or serious mishaps. They adhered to the Navajo's desires. They only needed one ferry instead of two. They were close to Escalante in those resources. Uh, it reduced future travel time for supplies and families by, and to visit families by several weeks. They developed great unity. They were temple, tempered. It tempered the participants for the challenges ahead. I like what Human Jones said, six months amidst one of the most severe win in, in the midst of one of the most severe winters. It looks to me like there was something more than human power or wisdom associated with it. Surely the hand of providence had been over the traveling pilgrims, and I switched the slide too soon. If you have plenty of stickity tutti you cannot fail. Now, one last concluding thing. I think it was at a presentation five years ago to the Lymans a young man at the end of it, after I explained their successes, asked me, well, what came of it? And I talked about developing firm relations with the Utes and the Navajos and establishing Blanding and Monticello and supporting those saints in Colorado. And he kept saying after that, well, what else came of it? And then it hit me. What came of it, uh, what came of our ancestors, your ancestors' difficult trials, is you. And that's the most important part of what they accomplished. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Any questions? Where did they get the material at that point to build the ferry? Okay, the ferry material, the Escalante Mountains, right in the back door of Escalante, had a sawmill. And so they built the ferry at Escalante in a prefabricated form, then dismantled it, 
hauled it to the hole and put it back together. But did it travel with them on the initial journey or did they go back for it? No, it, while they were building the road through the hole in the rock is when they were building the ferry at Escalante. So sometime before they crossed is when they, the people in Escalante brought out the ferry. And I didn't mention, uh, there are some other unsung heroes, those who crossed the Escalante mountain in those deep snows to bring in the blasting powder. That had been quite an ordeal. That in and itself would make quite a movie, I believe. It's too bad we don't even know who those men were. Did they take the pieces of the ferry down the hole? Yes, they assembled it at the bottom. Well, they used that when when it arrived, they were already the hole in the rock road was well enough established so that they didn't have to use jackass paint anymore. Yes. Do you have any documentation as to just when the marriage with Penny Moss Clark and Bunny Lyman took place? I can't see when he had time. <laughs> <laughs> well, Family Search has a date. It was. It was just four weeks before he left, so, but I, Family Search does have their marriage date. Roswell Stevens was the oldest person, and it's great we've got a descendant of him here, and he was the first one to die just a few weeks, I believe, after they arrived in Bluff. And there was no timber to make his coffin, so they made his coffin out of his wagon box that brought him to Bluff, as I understand. Anything else? Yes. And was older, maybe that's why he gave this opinion, but he said this was more severe to him. Yes, he did. Jens Nilsson was part of the Willie Handcart Company. He was the chaplain for the Hole in the Rock expedition and the first bishop in Bluff. And uh, he said, wrote it down, that the journey of the Hole in the Rock was more difficult than what he experienced, that he experienced a horrible ordeal. His only son at the time died in the Willie Hancock trip, and he became so crippled, he had begged his wife to leave him along the trail on the Willie journey, and she refused, and they loaded him in the handcart, and, and uh, she pulled him to the rescue teams and he was partially crippled the rest of his life from that. Anything else? I think it's, yes. Let's see, you mean as far as the side that says Smith and, yeah. Well, he was called as the chaplain, so his responsibility was, I guess, the religious welfare. Uh, and then, one of the remarkable things, I, my time's over, but one of the remarkable challenges that Platt B. Lyman had, I didn't make this clear, Silas S. Smith left after they decided to go on at 40 Mile Spring. Uh, he was a member of the state legislature. He went back to Salt Lake to raise funds and to get the blasting powder and the man. And he got sick uh, back there. So he did not rejoin them until they arrived at Bluff. So this 32-year-old, young man, Platt D. Lyman, was in charge of the entire journey. When they arrived at Bluff, Bluff had been designated as one of the land claim areas, but there was not enough property. When they looked at the size of the lots, they felt they needed to support a family. Uh, they're only, it could only support two-thirds of the company. And the rest would have to move up to, fort, to uh, Montezuma Fort. And, but they were united and they were tired and they didn't want to go anywhere. They all wanted to stay together, but there just wasn't enough land. So they drew lots. And they drew lots to see who could stay in Bluff, who would have to leave. Platt D. Lyman drew a blank lot. He would be one of the ones who would have to go along with 
another third of the company. But the people that, that drew blank lots didn't want to leave. They were too tired. They wanted to stay. So another man proposed, let's just share, divide the land equally, we'll have smaller lots. They asked for a sustaining vote and it didn't carry. And so Platt D. Lyman was in an awkward situation because he had a blank lot. Uh, and, uh, but he negotiated over a three day period with the people and eventually someone else proposed and it may have been him Let's throw in the land claims that were made by the earlier explorers the year before. That was one advantage of being an explorer. You could make the first land claim. And they made some big land claims. If, if they will give up their land claims, then let's all divide it equally. And that carried. And that's what they did. All right, thank you so much.